from the lab to your ears, you're listening to Wonder Labs. Hey everyone, and welcome to Wonder Labs, and welcome to the first episode of season two. They say you should begin as you mean to go on, but I'm not sure that's possible after this conversation with Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Dr. Gallimore is a neurobiologist, chemist, and pharmacologist by day, but he also has a big interest in the psychedelic compound DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is why we brought him onto the show. So DMT is the compound that we talked about with Imperial College London's Centre for Psychedelic Research back in episode four, and it also inspired the documentary bonus episode, Harmonics of Mind. If you haven't yet listened to those, they're a nice compliment to this conversation. So Dr. Gallimore has recently written a book, Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies and the Cosmic Game, which is out now and explores the possibility of accessing high dimensional intelligence through extended use of DMT. By injecting participants with a steady timed release of DMT, Dr. Gallimore believes it may be possible to escape what he calls a lower dimensional slice of a high dimensional structure. And this builds on his earlier work, including a paper he published alongside the psychiatrist Rick Strassman, who's the author of The Spirit Molecule, which later became a documentary presented by Joe Rogan. In this episode, we cover some basic DMT pharmacology and what makes it unusual versus other psychedelics. We launch into his new book that he calls A Textbook from the Future. We also touch on string theory, the simulation hypothesis, and the predictive power of sci-fi. I was amazed that having barely touched down in Japan, I was able to link up with one of the world's leading voices on DMT and really couldn't wait to get him on the show. It's a different sort of conversation to most on Wonder Labs, and I'm sure you'll love being taken down the rabbit hole as much as I did. Dr. Gallimore, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's nice to speak to you. So before we get down the rabbit hole, I thought we could start off with something nice and light. Perhaps you can just briefly introduce yourself. So I'm Andrew Gallimore. I'm a computational neurobiologist, or at least these days I'm a computational neurobiologist. However, my kind of academic career began as a more of a chemist and a pharmacologist and has kind of evolved towards neurobiology over the last few years um, because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in drugs. And broadly, I guess I'm interested in psychoactive drugs. I'm interested in drugs that affect one's state of mind, basically, uh, that have effects on consciousness, I guess, broadly. More specifically, I'm interested in psychedelic drugs, which is a particular class of psychoactive drugs that um, LSD, psilocybin from magic mushrooms, mescaline from the peyote cactus, and DMT, specifically dimethyltryptamine. So, but DMT is the one that I focus most of my attention on these days. So dimethyltryptamine, could you... Tell us a little bit about the molecule, the pharmacology, the effects. Yes, so so DMT is, in a way, it's probably the simplest of all of the what are called classic psychedelics. Uh, and classic psychedelics uh, are basically those for LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, and, uh, and DMT. There are others as well, but all of the classic psychedelics are unified by the way that they work in the brain and that they are they bind to a specific type of serotonin receptor in the brain to cause their effects how binding to this receptor then leads to these uh, varied and quite dramatic and profound effects on consciousness is still the subject of uh, intense inquiry by a number of research groups around the world however DMT itself uh, has very characteristic and dramatic effects on consciousness that that kind of set it aside from the other classic psychedelics. I kind of uh, always describe it as drugs like LSD or magic mushrooms. They, they change the world from being stable and predictable uh, to being unstable, unpredictable, and novel. They change the world. Uh, they make the world kind of more fluid, Whereas DMT does something quite different, whereas the other psychedelics generate a kind of an altered version of this world, um, certainly at normal uh, recreational doses, uh, DMT does something quite different in that it actually 
causes the the normal what we call the con consensus world to uh, essentially disappear and be replaced by a, a completely entirely different world that has no relationship whatsoever to the normal waking world and so dmt is kind of a it's a reality switch it switches the brain into constructing an entirely different model of reality that is often replete with this extremely diverse uh, panoply of highly intelligent beings that will often communicate with the uh, with the tripper um, so yeah, so DMT has these very, very special properties that, that make it extremely interesting for someone like me. It certainly seems to be having a moment. It's obviously a molecule that's captured the attentions and imaginations of indigenous peoples for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, even if they didn't necessarily know it as such. And more recently, you made reference to the fact that there are several groups around the world now exploring the mechanisms that are at work underpinning its mode of action and also what the experience is like for the tripper. We previously had Chris Timmerman on from the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London who spoke about a fMRI brain imaging study. I believe you were actually involved in that protocol. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the Imperial team, they've previously done neuroimaging work firstly with psilocybin back in 2011-2012 and, and, and m most recently with LSD which was published much more recently. So the, the next logical step for them was to start looking at DMT. It was the kind of the major psychedelic that was kind of missing from their repertoire. So in 2016 myself and Rick Strasman who did the, the largest study ever of, of the effects of DMT in human volunteers back in the 90s. Uh, we published mm. uh, a paper. A model for the application of target-controlled intravenous infusion for a prolonged immersive DMT psychedelic experience. That's the paper, yes. So we published that in 2016 with the aim of extending the DMT state from kind of a few minutes to you know any length of time, really. It could be a few hours. It could even be in, in, in theory. Uh, a few days and the the imperial team wanted to perhaps use this technology this infusion and so m myself and rick offered some advice and there was some, some kind of consultation with us and and how they might achieve this but in the end actually they they decided it was perhaps a step too far for this <laughs> first studies to attempt this kind of continuous infusion protocol so they they plumped for a, a more kind of traditional, as far as I'm aware anyway, I mean, I haven't seen their exact protocol they use, but I'm, as far as I'm aware, they, they plumped for a more of a, it's called a bolus protocol where they simply inject the drug. And what's tricky about that kind of thing is that because the DMT state, the DMT experience only lasts a few minutes, you, you have a short window of time during which you can perform kind of experiments. And anyone who knows anything about M MRI knows that often you need to have someone in the machine for some period of time to get data. Um, that's changing now with, with modern modern MRI techniques and processing techniques. Um, but you know, it used to be that you have to put someone in the machine for you know forty five minutes or something like that to get any kind of meaningful data. But I think ch things are changing now. But clearly, they've been able to do the study without using this kind of extended infusion protocol. So they're sticking very much to the businessman's trip. The short. 50 minute, whereas I suppose you're looking at more of a long-term vacation. Uh, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, and So we're interested more in expeditions in, in DMT space rather than just sort of popping in on your lunch break, so, uh, so to speak. Um, we're interested in what happens to an individual when they enter this space and they remain there for, for several hours. I mean, one of the characteristic features of the DMT state, the DMT experience, is that upon entering this space, which is normally preceded by this uh, kind of acceleration through this startlingly complex procession of uh, highly uh, complex visual imagery, and then you kind of burst through a, a kind of a veil and tumble into this hyperdimensional realm. This is known as breaking through uh, in the underground DMT community. 
And what's noticeable is even if you're there for a, a few minutes, the DMT state is often quite unstable and you find yourself struggling to orient, orient oneself inside the space. Uh, and that might be a fundamental feature of the DMT space, that it doesn't have this kind of stability that we're used to in, in our normal kind of three-dimensional, four-dimensional world. But it also could be simply that the brain is struggling to kind of make sense during these early stages and that the world that one experiences uh, under the influence of DMT might actually stabilize if, if, if somebody can stay there and remain within the space for two or three hours and things might settle down and you can actually start to establish kind of communication with any beings there or uh, to even sort of map the space, that kind of thing. And we're definitely about to get into that, but a couple of side points on what you've just spoken about before. This is made possible by some interesting quirks that DMT has that don't seem to be characteristics shared by some of the other psychedelics. So tolerance, for instance, appears to be quite different in a sense that with something like LSD or psilocybin, there is a window after the trip during which time the effects will not be as great. But that's not the same with DMT. Yes, exactly. So DMT actually has a number of pharmacological peculiarities that, that set it out as being different from these other classic psychedelics. As you point out, with, with something like psilocybin and even more so with LSD, the first most kind of notable feature of, of a drug like LSD is the duration of action in that it, it's 8 to 12 hours. Um, psilocybin shorter, but still several hours. Um, whereas the DMT experience is is literally you know a few minutes, so in addition to that, um, psilocybin and LSD they do they do exhibit this this subjective tolerance. Tolerance is quite a complex topic in pharmacology. There are different types of tolerance, but basically we're interested in how does the experience, the actual sub, the intensity of the experience, change with repeated doses that are sh spaced. A uh, short time apart, mm. and we know that with LSD, if you take LSD one day and and try to have the same experience, you know, one or two days later, you you will struggle because there is this quite rapid increase in subjective tolerance. And the same with psilocybin. However, what's interesting about DMT is that you can inject somebody with a, a breakthrough dose of DMT, and then thirty minutes later, after they have returned and are back at their baseline state, you can inject them with the same dose and they will have an experience of the same intensity. Uh, and Rick Strassman, in his studies in the 90s, actually demonstrated this and, and he wrote a, a paper on this very topic. Rick Strassman developed something called the hallucinogen rating scale, which which is a, basically a questionnaire that someone who's just had an, an experience can fill out and it will quantitatively tell you, you know, how, how intense was that experience. So it's a good way of measuring the intensity of experience that someone experiences. And um, yeah, what Rick was able to demonstrate in a number of volunteers was that he gave them DMT of 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. So this is a breakthrough dose. And he gave it to them uh, spaced 30 minutes apart, I think he did, uh, and showed that the intensity of their experience was the same each time. So that shows there's a lack of subjective tolerance. With an experience that typically people have and then go away and make sense of for a little bit of time, what might the implications be for prolonging that state with this protocol that you and Rick have proposed? Well, I mean, this kind of length of experience wouldn't be something that would be attempted by uh, neophytes or, 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 <laughs> or kind of novices who, who don't have extensive experience with DMT. This is, this is clearly... Expert mode. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. This is definitely expert mode. And I would say the majority of people, including myself, almost certainly, uh, <laughs> probably wouldn't volunteer for this, this kind of study. For most people, it's, it's beyond comprehension. Most people struggle to deal with a, a five-minute DMT trip and to actually be plunged into this space and held there for, for several hours, I think is extremely challenging. But what is nice about the technology is that you can control the level of the experience, first of all, or well, something you can't do with LSD. When you, if you administer some LSD, there, there's no straightforward, clean way anyway to kind of just bring them out at will. Whereas with this mm. infusion protocol, you can control the level of DMT in the brain with some degree of accuracy. And you can actually remove someone from the DMT state in short order. So cutting off the infusion 
given some kind of signal from them that would of course be agreed beforehand a kind of a um what is it like a safety word yeah safety <laughs> phrase um then then you then you would be able to bring them out of the state within two or three minutes so it's like deep sea diving but with a clear connection to the surface um so that would be i think comforting for, for people knowing that they're not stuck in this place once they agree they want to do a two-hour expedition they're not going to be stuck there for two hours unless they continue to consent throughout that two-hour period. It's a frightening concept, but I, I imagine that what would happen is that individuals would go into this space for increasing periods of time over an extended period of time. It wouldn't be, they wouldn't be coming st straight off the street and be asked to, um, to go into the DMT space for three or four hours. It would be a, it would be a process. Mm. And then just pop on the jacket and get straight back out onto the street. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, yeah. I really like the deep sea diver metaphor there because previously I've heard it compared to anesthesia, but anesthesia sort of has connotations of being stuck under for an unpredictable amount of time and perhaps never even coming back. Whereas the deep sea diver basically means that you've got the switch that you can use to bring people back out at will. So I think that that works much better than the, the anesthesia comparison. So that protocol that you're talking about, in some sense, underpins your new book, Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies and the Cosmic Game. And on the back, there's a really beautiful quote from the late, great Terence McKenna, which is, We are imprisoned in some kind of work of art. So I thought we could maybe use that as a jumping off point for you to explain your thesis. Sure. Yeah. So this is a McKenna quote that always struck me as being a um, a very kind of pithy and very interesting quote that at first reading doesn't really seem to make much sense. It's like, what does he mean by a work of art and how could we possibly be imprisoned within it? Um, but I kind of incubated that idea for a number of years because I felt that it, it, it kind of imported some profundity that was perhaps not immediately apparent on the surface and that actually if one thought about well, what he was actually trying to say there were some really quite deep implications and 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 so the book was um not entirely inspired by that but i i, I kind of took this idea of yeah what if our reality really was constructed in some way or was kind of some kind of work of art as he puts it and that we are indeed trapped or imprisoned within it and and if so, then what does that mean? What are the implications? If we are imprisoned, is there a means of escape? Is there a, a way out of the prison? Uh, is the the escaping from the prison some kind of game? And this is what I call it, this, this cosmic game, that our reality is a, what I've called in the book, a, a lower dimensional slice of a higher dimensional system, and we are embedded within or emergent within. We find ourselves emergent within this lower dimensional slice. Um, and the, the name of the game is to find the way out. And I think DMT is the secret, if you like, um, to, es to escaping and finding our way out of this prison, as McKenna put it. So let's go in a little bit deeper then. So you said that DMT is part of the key to escaping from the prison. Yes, exactly. What do you mean by that? So imprisoned, it was McKenna's words. Imprisoned has very kind of negative connotations that I would perhaps avoid. But I think what I propose in the book is that our reality is in some way an encoded reality that fundamentally is constructed, um, is instantiated by some kind of fundamental code. And this is fully described and kind of justified in the book. Uh, it doesn't kind of come from nowhere. People have linked it to, to simulation theory, but there are good reasons why I don't do that. I feel that this intelligence from outside of our universe, this hyper-intelligence, as I call it, the kind of intelligence that you actually meet when you ingest DMT, um, is responsible for encoding our universe, and then we find ourselves emergent. So basically the idea is if you encode enough universes and you encode all possible universes, then some of them will give rise to complex structures. Within a small number, a small subset of these universes, you will get the emergence of, of complexity. And, and this complexification 
will continue towards potentially living and conscious organisms and we happen to find ourselves emergent within one of these lucky universes and once a species reaches a certain level of, of, of cognitive sophistication and, and intelligence the question then becomes for the the hyper intelligence that encoded this reality is how, how they might decide or not decide to actually communicate with us and it's my contention that DMT, which is a ubiquitous compound that is found scattered throughout the natural world. Dennis McKenna, Terence McKenna's brother, used to say that nature is drenched in DMT. And so DMT strikes me as perhaps a kind of a message that's scattered around the natural world um, that is everywhere, but which can only be read and decoded by a species with quite sophisticated levels of, of intelligence and we are one of those species and so the idea is that, that this message is embedded in our reality and but we must discover it and it's kind of an intelligence test in a way we must discover the message and we must learn how to use it uh, which translates in our world as, as discovering that dmt is has these properties and isolating it and learning then how to actually uh, utilize it what dmt does the actual function of dmt in all of this game is to change the way the brain operates in, in a br in a broad sense um, such that it can actually s receive information from this higher dimensional space um, so we are in the, we are a lower dimensional slice of this high dimensional system and it's the information from this high dimensional system uh, that is gated by dmt allowing us to basically glimpse temporarily actually become part of this high dimensional system within which this uh, hyper intelligence uh, resides so you mentioned a species that reaches a certain level of intelligence in order to unlock the capabilities of dmt but of course a species is made up of individuals so i suppose if it is an intelligence test what you're suggesting is those who explore dmt as this gateway to an alternative dimension is that passing the intelligence test yes well i mean it's it's not a, sim a simple pass or fail it's it's an intel it's a continuous intelligence test in that any technology that's developed is is always developed initially by one or perhaps a small number of people and yet it uh, eventually it becomes ubiquitous i mean you think about a mobile phone for example now, and the same thing kind of applies to, in my opinion, to DMT in that, yes, at the moment it, it remains quite niche, but since the 1950s when DMT was discovered as the, the active component of these indigenous snuffs, these hallucinogenic snuffs uh, by Stephen Zara, who is a um, Hungarian physician and chemist, since then, the, the technology has been developed. We've, we've learned how DMT needs to be administered uh, to achieve its effects. And now, as a species, but really just as really at the moment, a very, very small number of people within our species are actually thinking about how we go beyond this and how we actually use DMT the way it is intended. And and it's not intended that it's it's simply used by smoking from a small glass pipe, in my opinion. I believe that mm -hmm. that we need to think about the potential of DMT. And if, if, if we really believe that DMT really does allow access to this hyperdimensional realm that's kind of orthogonal uh, to ours, that is uh, inhabited by extremely high levels of intelligence, then it makes sense that we, we we don't kind of just burst into this space unannounced for a few minutes and then just disappear just as quickly. But mm. in fact, that we we learn how to enter this space and then remain there and establish communication. And that's the next step, if you like, of this game, is to actually learn what learn exactly how DMT should be used and can be used in order to um, give us much more stable and, and, and prolonged access to this space. What is the message? Well, the message is that we are a very, very thin slice of something far greater than we could possibly imagine, and that reality is indeed stranger than we, stranger than we can suppose, as a number of people have said, and that actually we aren't trapped permanently within this lower dimensional slice but actually there are there are ways out and that, that dmt provides that that gate if you like 
that allows us to move from um, kind of earthly citizens towards you know hyperdimensional citizens, citizens of hyperspace, um, and that this could in fact be the natural progression of intelligence is that it, it it moves from this very kind of low level low dimensional kind of parochial development on a planet in a lower dimensional slice of this system and then ultimately learns when it reaches a, a certain level of, of sophisticated intelligence is actually able to escape this lower dimensional slice and actually become permanently become part of this high dimensional system and you know that could be one of the ways that this system works is that you use lower dimensional slices to kind of incubate and culture, really. Culturing conscious intelligences in a lower dimensional system and then allowing them, once they develop, to actually become part of the, the higher dimensional system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> as far out as all of that sounds... I don't actually see it as being too far removed from more conventional science. In a sense, what you're getting at is understanding the nature of reality. Yes, I mean, very few sober physicists would be able to completely rule out the possibility of, of some kind of multiverse or some kind of larger system within which we are uh, embedded in some sense and and and, and indeed it, it forms the basis of a number of ways of thinking about the structure of our reality quite mainstream ones in fact what's perhaps a little bit further out is is the idea that actually these orthogonal dimensions of reality might actually be accessible and accessible you know with great facility by by inhaling you know a couple of lungfuls of one of the simplest alkaloids in the plant kingdom that would be that would be the true shocker not that these places exist because you know who could rule them out um, but it's easy to speculate on what might or might not exist and physicists might talk all day about you know multiverse theory or uh, brains in m theory or these kind of things um, and it's it's wonderful to do that but what i'm suggesting is that well we can actually confront these spaces you know confront your ideas about the structure of reality put it to the test you know in a very very direct experiential way uh, by actually literally going to these places so the book explores this thesis at great length. I've heard people refer to it as a great introduction to simulation theory, which to me is quite a compelling philosophical idea that's been around for a very long time in science and mythology and philosophy and maybe most recently popularized by Nick Bostrom's simulation argument. But you said earlier on that you're quite keen to make the distinction between your book and simulation theory. I mean, you're right. Simulation theory has... has um, with the likes of Elon Musk talking about it and, and a number of other people. And, of course, the Matrix trilogy, for goodness sake. You know, this is, this is all simulation theory kind of stuff. And, um, but people often people will talk about simulation theory without really defining what is meant by a simulation. And we need to be very, very careful um, because simulation has a very specific meaning. Uh, and if you actually read Nick Bostrom's original paper, Are We Living in a Computer Simulation, or, or words to that effect, um, he defines very clearly what he means. And he means, when he says a simulation, he means a an ancestor simulation. So the mm. idea is that um, highly intelligent post-humans, um, so humans that had evolved way beyond the stage that we're at now, uh, with massive computational power would decide to run simulations of their ancestors i.e. us um, so that is a simulation why is that a simulation well because there is a real counterpart the real counterpart would be the actual ancestors who are now all dead of course um, so we will be a simulation of those ancestors um, and so Whenever you talk about a simulation, there's always two components. There's the, the simulation and, and the actual thing that's being simulated. So if you believe that this reality is a simulation, then you need to say a simulation of what? You know, what is the real world? What does the real world look like? How is it different? In what way is it different? Simulations are not simple replications, but they, they, they replicate a reduced number of features of the real thing. 
So I'm a, I'm a computational neurobiologist. I, do, I run simulations every day. I might simulate, for example, a neuron, a nerve cell, and, and its behavior. Now, I don't have to build down to the level of atoms and quarks a neuron in order to simulate one. I simply have to find out, you know, what are the characteristic features? What are the important parts of the way um, this neuron functions? What are its important channels? Uh, what, are it, what, what are the ions and molecules that are essential for this, for the particular type of behavior that I want to simulate? And then I can do a, a simulation on a computer. So, so here, the, the distinction between the simulation and the thing being simulated is very, very clear. With simulation theory, when applied to our kind of reality, it's not so clear. What would our reality really look like, uh, the true reality? In what ways would it be different? And so I, the reason I don't like simulation theory really is because there's no reason to suggest that reality shouldn't be like this, that actual reality shouldn't be like this. There's no reason why this should be a simulation. People point to the fact that reality seems to be, at its most fundamental level, it's discrete. It seems to be constructed from individual pieces. So from space and time, there seem to be smallest possible units of space and of time. Uh, and the same with things like quantum states of electrons, for example. An electron can only exist in a finite number of particular states. Uh, and people have questioned, you know, why is that? You know, this, this suggests the kind of digital nature of reality. And I run with this idea, the idea that reality is fundamentally digital and constructed from information at, it, at its ground level. And this draws heavily from what's kind of a nascent field of physics called digital physics, or more recently, digital philosophy, uh, which was developed largely by a computer scientist called Ed Fredkin. Uh, but he was inspired by others and, and other very quite prominent physicists and mathematicians, um, John Wheeler, a very, very famous and very important late physicist, coined the phrase it from bit, the idea that, that all reality emerges from, from some kind of fundamental information. Uh, and more recently, the mathematician Stephen Wolfram, uh, who wrote a book called a new, a new Kind of Science, in which he describes the way that fundamental digital information can, can complexify and self-organize and, and create highly complex structures that could ultimately become living organisms such as ourselves. So uh, I don't see that kind of reality as being a simulation of a reality. I call it an, an instantiation of a reality. It's, it's one possible way you can structure a reality, but it's not a simulation of anything. It doesn't, there's nothing being simulated. It's just that you can, you can run a, a reality like ours, if you like, on a, on a computer, and, and basically wait and see what happens. I don't think we were created. I don't think in Nick Bostrom's view of the world, humans were designed to replicate and, and simulate the original humans that are being simulated. I don't see it like that. I see it that our reality may well have been encoded or many, many, many different, all the different kind of possible universes were, were encoded as digital realities and within us as i say a small subset we find ourselves emergent but we're certainly not um, we're certainly not created in a kind of creationist god-like sense um, but we just find ourselves emergent within this digital reality so you know th there are perhaps many ways you can make realities um, and a, a kind of the digital reality that we're in is is just one of those mm. <laughs> mm. How do you like that? How do you like them apples? <laughs> How do you like them realities? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oof. So one one thing I do just want to pick up on is the idea of something being digitally encoded. Or in the title of the book, you refer to technologies and games. Do you think that this is how we conceptualize reality based on the things that we find within our culture? Well, I think people often criticize the idea the idea of a digital reality. They, people say, well, you know, in a couple of hundred years ago, people would have described the universe as being like a clock or something like that, because that was, that was the technology of the time. And, and yes, you know, it is tempting to say that the reason we, we think of the world as, as being digital um, is because, you know, we live in a digital era and, um, you know, everyone's used to computers and everyone understands the way that computers run using digital information. But I'm, I'm proposing a much more fundamental idea of, of, of digital and digital 
again, we should probably define our term. What do we mean by digital? So um, what I mean by digital is is information that is uh, encoded discreetly. So what I mean by that uh, is that there are fundamental pieces, if you like, of our reality that can can switch between a finite, uh, probably a very small number of, of states and generate information in that way. Uh, but I don't necessarily mean that there is some computer um, sitting outside our universe that is that is running our reality as such, but simply that it is a fundamental nature of our reality that is constructed from discrete uh, pieces. The computer analogy is, is there, and, and it's inescapable, um, but really there are only two fundamental ways you can kind of do things. You can do things continuously uh, where things can vary infinitely, um, or you can do things digitally uh, where you've got um, uh, fundamental kind of pieces and, and 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 from looking at the structure of reality it seems to be um, for the most part it seems to be a digital system so the metaphor is inescapable but the reality is escapable <laughs> uh, yeah exactly exactly yes yes the the the, the connection to, to computer science will always be there and and i've al- I've, I've always thought that perhaps this drive towards um, the digital world that we find ourselves you know, in the technological and information age um, is actually some kind of deep, profound expression of, of some fundamental quality of our reality and that it's kind of, it's almost inescapable that, uh, that a species that emerges in a digital reality will eventually discover techniques for exploiting that in, in some way. So I don't think... Yeah, okay, we do live in a, a modern digital kind of electronic world, but I don't think that is a, it is a strong case for dismissing the idea that reality is also digital. Agreed. And if the means of escaping this reality involves an analog compound like DMT or a digital alternative like VR, I know which one I'd prefer. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> me too. So alien information theory, psychedelic drug technologies in the cosmic game, Fiction or non-fiction? <laughs> I know when we first spoke about the book, you described it as very hard sci-fi. And sci-fi throughout history has been a brilliant means of criticizing culture, things like Frankenstein and Brave New World. But at a more fundamental level, sci-fi has played and continues to play a really important role in capturing our imaginations and perhaps even having some predictive power for the future. So how do you conceptualize the book as a work of very hard sci-fi? Okay, so very hard sci-fi. So that kind of naturally <laughs> raises the question of what, what is hard science fiction? So, so hard science fiction is a kind of genre or branch of science fiction where the, the author is, in their narrative, goes to great pains to ensure that the science is as accurate as possible. So very hard science fiction, which I've just coined that term, it, it doesn't exist as a, as a genre, is, is how you might describe somebody who essentially writes, I mean, the book is, is kind of, I call it a textbook from the future. So it, it, it appears like a popular science book. There's no fictional narrative. It's not a work of fiction. It's, it's a work of nonfiction, but it's highly speculative nonfiction in which I am envisioning reality. I'm thinking, hey, you know, what if Terence McKenna was right? And what if we really are living within that reality, this kind of encoded digital reality from which we can escape? And how would it work? And can we use the strict scientific underpinning uh, and not go completely out of the scientific arena entirely uh, and just go wild i mean that you know one can write a science fiction novel and go as crazy as one wants and there isn't there are no restrictions but what i'm trying to do is actually paint a picture of reality that could actually be true and that would kind of dovetail and explain a lot of the features of the DMT experience. So um, so that's why I would call it very hard science fiction in that it's almost indistinguishable from uh, a book about science, like a textbook about science. You know, a book you might read on um, the structure of reality by someone like Brian Greene or something, right, um, mm. that would describe their vision of reality and they might base it upon string theory or something like that I, i'm in a way it's a similar kind of idea 
but it's it's a little bit more far out than than <laughs> what, what Brian Greene would attempt in that it, it relies on some quite fringe areas of scientific kind of world views you know digital physics is still kind of a niche area of physics and is certainly not broadly accepted by the physicist community and going with that uh, and trying to to piece together a kind of coherent narrative about the way that our reality uh, could be constructed so i'm not saying that our reality is exactly like i paint it in the book but that it could be so i pick up my copy of the textbook from the future i begin to understand the message and who knows maybe even decide to explore prolonged immersive dmt experiences with the protocol that yourself and rick are suggesting what then well we're, we're kind of at the early stages of you know i think we're towards the end game in the grand scheme of things as an intelligent species in that we're kind of close to the end but we're still at the beginning of that end game if that makes sense in that we really don't know what's going to happen when we plug someone into this machine and we have to develop this technology first of all but it's my contention that perhaps our entire reality is is, is encoded and is constructed of, from information that also applies to the, the world that we we live in in a subjective world and also our brains and this has a, a fundamentally information based construction and that what dmt might allow one to do if you are able to use it in the correct way for, for this extended period of time and this extended period of time might be days might even be weeks uh, we don't really know but ultimately the idea would that you, you would transfer the informational structure of your brain and consciousness basically to this orthogonal hyperdimensional realm to which dmt gates access so rather than just visiting this space you would actually permanently transfer yourself into this space that would be the ultimate end game if this vision of reality was correct <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not down for heading to mars with elon musk any volunteers who would like to participate please reach out to dr andrew callamore <laughs> yes please do yes so what we normally like to do to wrap things up is a quick fire round are you game Okay, sure, go ahead. Can you explain in a couple of sentences what your thesis is? That we live in a lower dimensional slice of reality and that we can escape it and that DMT provides the key to that door. Outside of DMT-related research, what emerging field or idea are you most excited about right now? Well, I think... Staying outside of DMT, but within the kind of psychedelic arena, for me, I think that psychotherapeutic applications of psychedelic drugs is going to completely revolutionize psychiatry in the next 10, 15 or so years. And we're going to move from a, uh, the state that has existed for the last few decades where individuals with a variety of almost intractable and incurable psychiatric conditions that are generally kind of managed with very, very prolonged pharmacological uh, intervention where people take um, you know, drugs for, for decades, perhaps, you know, to control conditions. We're going to reach the stage where people are going for two or three psychedelic drug sessions with follow-up and actually permanently curing their conditions. I mean, that's going to be a completely revolutionary approach to psychiatry that you're going to start seeing more and more about in the next few years, I think. Yeah, definitely an exciting space, including all the stuff that MAPS are doing with MDMA and post-traumatic stress disorder with veterans over in the US, all the way to stuff in the UK with psilocybin for depression and so on. Exactly, yes. Definitely stuff to watch. Mm -hmm. What is a misconception about DMT or psychedelics that if you could wave a magic wand and have it collectively erased from everybody's memories, what would that be? Well, there's there's a number and... and they all have the inception really at the beginning of the, of the drug war back in the in the 1960s and the idea that that psychedelics are dangerous the idea that psychedelics are bad for the mind uh, in some way and that they can trigger you know psychosis or lead to permanent brain damage these are part of a, a whole group of misconceptions uh, that have been propagated and promulgated and reinforced for, for many, many decades. And we're only now beginning to realize, or the wider public are now beginning to realize, that actually these are not 
purely dangerous drugs yes they have they have risks and they need to be used by people who understand what they're doing and taking these risks into account uh, but actually these drugs can actually be uh, of immense benefit not just in a therapeutic sense but in terms of actually understanding ourselves and understanding the world and understanding the relationship between ourselves and the world so I'd usually ask for a resource as to where we can send people to find out more. But in this case, I'm just going to direct them to your new book, Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies and the Cosmic Game by Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Yes, so that would be the way. Um, you can also go to my website, which is buildingalienworlds.com. And there you can read all the papers that I've written. You can watch some lectures that I've given, some podcast interviews you can listen to. And you can actually order the book directly. Or at least you can have a look at some kind of sample pages from the book. Uh, failing that, you can also order it, of course, from Amazon globally and various online bookstores. All of your favorite providers. Exactly. Dr. Andrew Gallimore, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning into Wonder Labs. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with others who you think might enjoy it. You can also email us at wonderlabspod at gmail.com. I'm your host, Chris Richardson. Our branding was designed by Lloyd Preston Allen, and our jingle was produced by T. Fitzgerald at For The Record. That's soundcloud.com forward slash W-E-A-R-E-F-T-R. Special thanks go out to Liliana Labordadosian. We'll see you next time.